This is October 24th, uh, 2009. Uh, we're in Simi Valley, California, and we're talking with John Lawton. Uh, John retired as general manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, uh, very involved in Colorado River issues at the time. John, thank you very much for uh, taking part in this oral history project for the Colorado River Board. My pleasure. Uh, and I, we probably need to tell people right off the bat, uh, you, uh, how old are you? <laughs> I'm 90-something. 90, 90, 96, it says over there. <laughs> 96, it says over there. And you retired from Metropolitan Water District uh, when? Well, must be 30-some years ago. Yeah, I, I want to say uh, late 1970s, 78 or 79, if I recall correctly. Uh, is that too late? Was it before? 79 is too late. It was before 79. Okay. I, but, and you were followed by Evan Griffith at uh, MWD, right. right? Well, let me ask you, uh, John, uh, let's go way, way back uh, when you uh, went to school and uh, why did you decide to uh, become an attorney? Well, I went to school in Glendale back in the. I think it must be the set. I can't remember the year now. Well, that's right. We came to California in 27. 1927? Yeah. From where? From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, lived here ever since. We were in Glendale most of the time and acted as city attorney for, I think, Glendale for a few years and then several years at Fresno. So you went from Glendale as a city attorney to city attorney. Fresno. I think I went from Fresno to city attorney. I went from Glendale as assistant city attorney to Fresno as city attorney and then back to Glendale. Oh, okay. And did you go from Glendale to Metropolitan or were right. there other steps? Right. I went... You're getting back a little point where it's fuzzy, but... I went from the, the, between the two jobs and the Metropolitan. Okay. So you spent most of your career then at uh, either the city of Glendale or at Metropolitan. Right. Uh, so uh, were you, obviously you were at the, uh, the really old MWD building downtown, uh, downtown Los Angeles. Hey, I woke. Yes. Okay, a slight interruption there for a phone call, but uh, we were just going back to establish uh, your career at the city of Glendale and yeah. then Metropolitan Water District. Did you, you went to Metropolitan as an attorney, as a staff attorney? As an attorney. Okay. And do you recall your progression then at MWD up through general manager? I mean, you you progress quite I nicely. Was general counsel. For, I can't remember. <laughs> I just know that I went from through the cities up into Met, Metropolitan. Okay, and so you became general counsel, which is the top legal position right. at Metropolitan. And I think down below that I'd been general counsel for the cities. Okay. Um, by the way, where did you go to law school? Just Bolt Hall of Law. Bolt Hall? Hall of Law. Perfect. Okay, right. Very good. Uh, <coughs> let's get down to uh, specifics then. Uh, and I'd like to talk about your recollections while you were at Metropolitan of uh, Colorado River issues that were facing Metropolitan while you were there. And I'll, there were all sorts of all sorts of issues. And I can't remember specifically any of the issues, but I, I if you mentioned one, I probably okay. That's fine. Uh, one of the things that uh, came up during the mid nineteen seventies, uh, around nineteen seventy five, was water for a nuclear power plant out in the desert. Yeah. Uh, do you recall that? And faintly. And what the concerns were at the time. No, I don't know what. All I know is that you built a power plant, you had to get it out of the cities. And 
out of the city there's lots, lots of water in the Metropolitan Water District system and the, so the, to provide power which was a primary source of energy for the cities uh, we felt it was not no more than right that we provide the power for the cities we were providing a water provide the power so uh, Metropolitan then was asked to provide water for cooling right. for these power plants and some of your early writings uh, I discovered indicated that uh, Southern California Edison was looking for about 40,000 acre feet of water from the Colorado River Aqueduct and as that conversation was going on with Edison the San Diego, uh, I'm sorry, the San Diego Gas and Electric Company and the LADWP also came right. to you and said, hey, we need some water for power plants out in the desert as well. I remember all those things happened. <laughs> uh, and, and so you were looking at, at the time, you were looking at a demand of about 100,000 acre feet of water yeah. off the river. Do you recall what your thoughts were at the time with regard to giving up that much water out in the desert? Well, giving it up was for the benefit of the people that live in the desert, our customers who live in the desert. Uh, you mean the customer? You mean MWD customers, but but also power customers. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you if you recall how comfortable you were giving up that much water. What, what, I oh. wasn't. I wasn't uncomfortable. I felt that was the most important, important use of the water at the time. Okay, that's that's fair enough. Um, now, there's a. Re you also write. Uh, well, let me let me backtrack a little bit. There's a. A program going on right now with an engineer out of uh, Las Vegas. His name is Mike Clinton, and you, you might I know Mike. You know Mike, and you knew his dad, Frank Clinton, yeah. who was also general manager yeah. at MWD. Uh, and I should add that uh, that Mike is the subject of one of these oral histories that's on file, and so people can watch that if they want to. But uh, by way of background, Mike is in Las Vegas right now, his office is in Las Vegas, and he's working toward a project that, that uh, at least one project that he was working on, uh, would take uh, saline water uh, out of the uh, uh, Colorado River Aqueduct. It's, you know, it's Colorado River water, and it's yeah. about 500, 600 parts uh, TDS and uh, would desalt that and generate a little bit of power in the process and uh, then move the uh, brine water down to the salt and sea. Uh, and, and by doing that, he would, uh, hit, according to his calculations, he would improve water quality, uh, generate some power, and add water to the salt and sea, which uh, you may recall is in a little bit of trouble because it's not getting enough water right now. Well, interestingly enough, you wrote about that very thing uh, back in the 70s. Yeah. About I, I couldn't see any problem. <laughs> I thought we, we could solve our problem just take, taking our wastewater, which was going away, and desalt it. And where, do you recall, where did that project go during your tenure at MWD? Well, I don't, that was just about the time I returned. I, my feeling is that the water that came out of that the sewer plant, the sewage plant, was good for trees, it was good for lawns, it was good for plants of any kind outside, and for most everything else except drinking. And what did we, what did we, what did we say we were out of water? We just used that, used the drinking water uh, for drinking and the, the sewage water for plants. Okay, now, uh, while we're on that subject, because you're really talking about a slightly different program than the one I was talking about, but that's fine, because you worked on them both. Yeah. In, in fact, one of your talks that you gave to uh, AWWA, the American Water Works Association at the time, 
talked about that very issue of reclaiming water, uh, taking uh, uh, sewage, maybe not sewage water, uh, but but other kinds of wastewater, uh, drainage and things like that, and, and reclaiming it. Uh, Metropolitan is now uh, very much engaged in those activities, uh, reclaimed water and and. Uh, I should go back one step, and I'll remind you, the State Water Project began delivering water in 1972 to Metropolitan right. while you were there, and one of the first uses of State Water Project, uh, at least according to your writings, was a seawater barrier. State Water Project water was injected yeah. along the coast to repel ocean water from coming in and fouling uh, freshwater uh, basins right. in the in the area and and so you wrote uh, again uh, in the mid to late 70s I don't know the exact date but you wrote uh, that that would be a perfect use for reclaimed water yeah instead of using potable that'd be, be much better you hit the, what <laughs> you, you, you by using the Water to re repel seawater. Uh, you're, you're doing a great good. Now, Metropolitan started doing that during your tenure or after you left? Uh, I, I mean, just about after. I, at the time I left, that I'd been working on. I said, "This is this is just a good program." Okay, so that was really. I mean that. That program is really one of the things that you left at Metropolitan. Yeah. Um, let me re let me remind you of another program that you left at Metropolitan, and you may not remember this, but you and Dick Balzerzak, uh, who was assistant chief of operations at the time, co-authored a paper about small hydroelectric plants because you had you had uh, pressure and pipelines throughout Metropolitan's distribution system, and it was being, the pressure, which is an energy potential, was being wasted. And you and, and Dick wrote a paper about uh, installing small, and I mean small, like, you know, maybe the size of your apartment here, to, to uh, capture that power. Do you recall? Uh, I remember the subject generally, yeah. Uh, do you recall if, I, I don't believe any of those were built while you were there, now let me think about that. There was one that went into operation in 1978 or 1979. I guess it would have been right after you retired. It was called the Gregg Avenue Power Plant. The which one? The Gregg Avenue Power Plant. It was in Burbank. And that was the first one of these small hydroelectric plants that MWD built. Do you recall that or was that after you left? That must be after I left. Okay. So, Essentially, you and, and Dick, and others, I mean, you, I mean, you and Dick co-wrote the paper, but I'm yeah. sure it was a, a team effort. Uh, so you guys came up with this thought that uh, that would be a, a heck of a thing to do. Well, as it turns out, just for your information, Metropolitan now has 15 of those small hydroelectric wow. plants uh, distributed throughout its, uh, its whole service area. Um, so I, that was, uh, you know, another concept that you and, and the team that was there while you were there, uh, kind of pioneered. Um, not bad for a lawyer. Well, I was going to ask you about that. How does a lawyer, or how do you specifically, how do you transition from the law, I mean, being general counsel, and now you're in charge of, of a large water district? distributes water and uh, treats it and uh, I mean you're doing all kinds of things that have nothing to have little to do with the law I, I was a city attorney and that was back, my background and uh, I, I guess when I was going to school I had to argue between going to law or engineering and I couldn't have when I took the choices, the cost of engineering was greater than law. You mean the tuition? 
it, just the cost to me, but it was more costly to go to uh, Caltech or Boston, one in Boston. Uh, MIT? Or? MIT. <coughs> and so I selected the law. I went to, to Bull Hall to Law in Berkeley. And that's how I got in. So you made an economic decision at the time. Yeah. Uh, but you always retained that interest in yeah. in the engineering side I, of things. I've always been, been interested in the engineering. Um, was that? Did you have any difficulties while you were at Met working with the engineers? No. Uh, because you know they're going off. Oh, yeah, that attorney doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, but uh, but you I, you got along with. Uh, no, no problem. No problem. I, uh, I always just talk, told them what I thought. And, they listen. Well, when you think back over your career, do you consider yourself an attorney or a water guy? <laughs> or both? I, or both. Both. Okay. You and I ran across each other for the first time in uh, the early 1980s. You, you had retired not too long ago, uh, at the Colorado River Water Users Association, which met in Las Vegas uh, each December. And uh, you attended those meetings for many years. That's right. After all, the time, you, all the time I was involved in water. Um, but even after you retired, yep. uh, you still attended. Uh, for a while. And let me, so let me ask you, why did you do that? When you get old, you don't have as much enthusiasm about moving from where you are to where the meetings are. Um, well, no, my question is, why did you continue attending those meetings uh, uh, with the Colorado River Water Users Association after you retired? Because oh, you did that for a lot of years. But I had spent years on the policies and things. I was interested in them, and I would have kept on going if it had been convenient for me to attend. Right. Um, did anything anything happen with regard to Colorado River issues after you retired that surprised you, or or you thought wasn't a particularly good idea? I'll give you a couple of thoughts. I mean, uh, after Evan Griffith left, then he was succeeded by Carl Baranke. And, and Carl made a deal uh, with the Imperial Irrigation District over transferring uh, conserved water from Imperial to Metropolitan. I, I think you recall that, that deal. Uh, what were, did you have any thoughts about that at the time? Well, I think any way you can expand the use of, or expand your source, expand the NWD sources. I, I, I felt that was a good idea. Okay. I, um, do you recall your relationship with Imperial or Palo Verde Irrigation District while you were there? Good, I bad? Was there, they're all, my recollection, good. Okay. So. I wasn't mad. I wasn't mad at them. They were. They weren't mad at me at the time. <laughs> well, that went back and forth after you left. Uh, went back and forth for a while. I mean, they were mad at Met, and Met was mad at them, and. And then they weren't, and then they were. So, uh, but while you were there, uh, relationships were really pretty good. I think they're pretty good. While you were at Met, uh, MWD began taking delivery of state water project water, 1972. Uh, can you go back there in your mind and, and think about? Uh, I mean, that was a good thing for Met. Uh, was that a big deal at the time, 1972, when you first started getting those deliveries? Well, from a standpoint of a water supplier, that yeah. was a big deal. Um, did it take some pressure off of the Colorado River Aqueduct at the time, or...? It, it, we weren't as concerned about what was going on in the Colorado as we were as the State Water Project. There's more water coming in. Right. Um, you also... With regard to the State Water Project, I'm going to read, uh, uh, well, no, I, I'll get to that in a minute. You may not recall, but you also wrote uh, about the Delta. 
the Sacramento San Joaquin yeah. Delta. And apparently there was a little bit of a fight going on between the state and the federal government uh, while you were there. This would have been the mid-70s, about the operation of the Delta. And some people were accusing the Bureau of Reclamation of destroying the Delta, and, and the state wanted to run all of the projects. You may recall there are two projects, two yeah. large projects in the Delta. One is the Central Valley Project, which is the federal government, and the other one is the State Water Project which is the state of California. And apparently, while you were at MWD, uh, the state of California wanted to run both projects. They didn't want the feds meddling in, in the Delta. Uh, do you, you recall any of that? Uh, I remember a little bit about it. Tussle, uh, were, were you engaged in that in any way? Uh, I mean, some of what you wrote, was it was pretty strong uh, with regard to how the Delta should operate. I don't have a recollection of what the issues were now. But it, it was a, a north-south problem. As it is today. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, in again, in reviewing some of your writings, one of the things you talked about, now keep in mind this is 2009 today, I'm going back to 1974, and you were writing about a peripheral canal, which is what they're talking about today, because it was never built. Yeah. Uh, do you recall your thoughts about uh, water? You, you characterized the peripheral canal as necessary for, one, water conservation, and number two, water quality. Uh, I can I, I can remember the in general, but not anything specific. Okay, in 1980, then, just six years later, the peripheral canal had been. Now you had retired by then, but you were still active. Uh, the peripheral canal had been approved by the legislature, but it was subjected to a referendum by the voters and the voters rejected it. They, they turned the bill around and it was not built. Uh, do you have any thoughts no. at that time about that's not a very good thing or that's a bad thing? I, I just know that it happened, but I just don't know my, what my thoughts, thoughts were about it. Okay. Uh, all right, so well, let's... I, my, my problem was I was trying to get the water from, from Met. So, so every, everything everything I did was tainted by my goal of getting water from it. And that didn't get water from it. Okay, let's expand on that. Why? I mean, maybe the answer is obvious, but I want to I want to drill into your brain anyway. Why did you need more water from Met? You had the Colorado River Aqueduct. I didn't. I didn't think the sources were unlimited. When you when you get a big big operation like Matt, you got to think further than just is, is now all right. You got to get to plan for the future. But the things that are for the, for the future have to be built now. <laughs> and we weren't ready for the now. These other things. So, uh, you want me to stop here and get a sip of water and. Okay, we uh, t took a break there for a, a sip of water. Speaking of water, I mean, it makes you thirsty when you when you talk about it this way. Uh, but uh, you were talking about planning for the future, uh, and that was your concern with regard to the state water project. While you were general manager, Metropolitan had an entitlement, or maybe entitlement's the wrong word, they they had available to them uh, about 1.2 million acre feet from the Colorado River. Uh, but you may recall from your legal background that uh, Met's apportionment in the in the contract is really only 550 thousand acre feet, and that they had been using uh, unused uh, water unused by other states for a lot of years. Uh, 
what did you ever have a concern that Metropolitan would one day be reduced to their actual entitlement, 550? I'm not sure that I ever uh, pinned it down to that one particular use. I was always concerned with getting a, a short supply of water for the future, and you had to keep looking at the most unlikable places to see whether it's possible to develop a, use, a drinking water. It's just that simple. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you look anywhere else uh, other than the uh, State Water Project? Were there other... Uh... We were looking at everything, not just the State Water Project. Okay. Uh, take that a little further if you can, when you say everything. Uh... Well, there was water in the north part of California. got involved with the, yeah, yeah the, the pipelines were taking care of all, all these different people. And I can't remember specifically. Do you remember conversations about water from out of state, like from Washington State or Oregon or? I don't think I ever thought that far ahead. The problems were too great. Okay, well, because one of the, one of your writings indicates that, uh, uh, you had been asked to look at water from Washington, the state of Washington, uh, and you wrote about the power costs of moving that water, if, if you could even build the project, but the cost of moving that water was, tr would be tremendous. Do you recall that? I, I can well recall that sort of discussion, but I, not the details of it. Okay. Uh, so that, but but that project, I mean, it, it came to naught, yeah. uh, and uh, I, I think I think part of that uh, was just your your thoughts and the thoughts of others at MWD at the time that it was just incredibly expensive and, and just was really not possible. Uh, so I maybe for if for no other reason we just put that one to rest because it comes up every once in a while. Uh, it's, you know, people think, oh my gosh, California's going to go to the, uh, you know, whatever river and uh, steal water from other states. And I, I think you wrote well while you were at Met that the, the, the costs and the economics of doing that just uh, really aren't there. So, uh, uh, and icebergs, you know, we, you've, I know you've heard that story that uh, why don't we just float some icebergs down here from Alaska <laughs> or, the, or the North Pole. Again, uh, a costly event, to say the least. Um, let me ask you about uh, what you've seen in California, in, especially in Southern California, over your lifetime, in terms of change and in terms of, of growth. Uh, I'll remind you that in 1970, uh, the population for, was projected in 1990. Let me restate that so I don't confuse anybody. A projection was made in 1970 that the population of Southern California in 1990, 20 years later, would be between 13 and 15 million people. Um, that's some pretty substantial growth. Uh, did you embrace those numbers in terms of looking for water supply, or did you think they were a little too high? Or? I, 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 I was under the pressure to meet whatever demand might come up and my, whether one got, one group was right or another one was right. I wanted to take care of the, the, the demands of everybody. Yet, uh, I didn't say that quite right. Well, let, I just wanted to be able to take care of everybody. And so I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but you would assume in putting together water supply for everybody, you would probably assume the higher number, the higher population estimate, just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Uh, you would want to have provided water for the 15 million people that were expected to be right. here in 1990. Um, so you, 
again, you weren't overly concerned about whether the numbers were right or wrong. You just wanted to make sure that there was enough water here for everyone. Right. Uh, as it turned out, the population of Southern, of southern California in 1990 uh, was, in fact, about 16 million people. So they weren't too far off with that projection. And the population today in 2009 is, uh, it's over 18 million people in Southern California. Did you ever imagine during your career that there would be that many people living here in Southern yeah. California? Yeah. So you, you assume that to be the case? Yeah. Uh, it, is it going to continue to grow in your mind? I think it will. I, the, California is unique in itself. And the part of California that's in MWD service area is very strong in growth. And I, I attribute the growth to the strength of the environment that exists in Southern California. You're, you're talking about the weather, uh, jobs? Jobs, uh, everything else. Right. Well, if Southern California is to continue to grow, as you indicate it will, where is that water coming from? Where, how, how do we meet that growth now? Well, that's where I was when I was retired. And my feeling is that it was very simple to extend our water supply by more extensive reuse of water. And if you look at the uses of water, you could put the water in the pipes. They would... Could, meet all the needs of all the lawns and all the irrigation and all the normal things, everything except drinking <laughs> from a sewage water. And you didn't need, didn't need fresh water, so you, the more water you could reuse uh, was added to your supply. Okay, reclaimed water is going on today, we know that, at a fairly low level uh, in terms of amount. Do you think people will be willing to pay the cost of reclaiming water to, ex as you say, to extend that water supply? I don't think that, that uh, you're saying that they, they wouldn't be willing to pay anything. I think they would be willing to pay whatever it costs. Okay, because reclaimed water by its very nature tends to be more expensive than... Uh, it's a, more, but not that much more. Okay, so uh, putting on your prediction hat, uh, you you would expect, or, or you would want, I suppose, reclaimed water to become a more important... Uh, I would think reclaimed water should be the most important to the or people who are drink, using the water primarily for drinking. And that if they can make reclaimed water available to do what they're now using drinking water for, uh, would extend our water supply. Okay, well that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Let's change the subject just a little bit here to energy because it's it's related. You said in 1975 that uh, you're actually writing a, uh, a counter argument to a member of the State Energy Commission in 1975, and that person said that uh, that the growth curves, as we just discussed, the growth curves were wrong and that energy conservation would be able to handle a lower level of growth that this person expected. And, and let me see if I can restate that a little bit. Uh, the, the person said that uh, 
Southern California was not going to grow as rapidly as the growth curves indicated and that he didn't see the need for additional energy or additional water projects. Uh, and his position was that conservation, if people would just conserve water... That's, that's, I agree with him. If you can get them to conserve, it's a matter of conser conservation. Is, it depends upon the motivation of people. And if they don't conserve, you, just, you don't have the water. Uh, do you think that concert well, let me rephrase that. Do you think that conservation would take care of all of the future demand or only a part of it? I suspect that the, the kind of close to take care of all of it. I'm not able to quite focus on it. Uh, well, let's try this. One of the things that you wrote about was water pricing. Because Metropolitan, while you were there, was supported in some measure by taxes, property taxes. And, and they still are to a lesser degree, but it's not a, not a critical part of their income stream. Um, but you wrote that the cost of water should be borne or paid for all, entirely by the water user. Otherwise, they're going to waste water. If it, and let me rephrase that. If you said that if people don't pay for the full cost of water, if they are subsidized by taxpayers, then they're going to waste water right. because there's no incentive to conserve. Uh, is that? That's about right. I mean, uh, so I characterized that thought yeah. reasonably well. And uh, so your, your position then and now would be that uh, everyone should pay uh, the full cost of delivering water to them. Right. Okay, now, now I'm, that's a little bit of a trap. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't mean to trap you, but I just wanted to see if I could stir some, some memories. Uh, agricultural users in California, or throughout the state, they don't pay the full cost of water. You may recall that the Bureau of Reclamation, the federal government, uh, uh, sells uh, federal water at, at below its cost. And, and indeed, even in California, if you go down to uh, the agricultural districts, Imperial and Palo Verde and Coachella, they, those farmers don't pay the full cost either. So now you've got agriculture involved here. What do you what do you think about charging them the full cost of water? Do you think that would work? I think more maybe charge them more than they're paying now on a long range pro, pro, program to bring them into where they should be. You can't do it. You do things like that over ten or twenty years, not instead of one or two, and you you can get there, but. Uh, over time, you, you, if you can persuade the farmers that they've been getting water they shouldn't be getting, they'll do. They'll conserve. Uh, is it your experience that uh, agricultural water could be conserved? I mean, there is some waste out well, there. Well, there's all no question about it. If you, if you got it, you use it. <laughs> Uh, why do you say there's no question about it? I mean, you sound very positive about that. I, I just, you, I'm just positive that uh, there's waste of water. We're, we're wasting it all the time. Okay. And, not just agriculture, but everybody. That's, that's right. You just have to have a will to do these things, and you have to, it takes a lot of training <laughs> to the, of the mass to get them to do what they should do. Yeah. Have you stayed current with the uh, drought that's going on right now? I mean, it's been, 
I believe about seven years now that uh, we're in below normal rainfall. Um, and not, not, I just know that we're not getting much rain. <laughs> okay. Uh, and of course you live in a in an apartment complex here so you don't need to worry about yeah. watering the lawn and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna uh, let me read something to you. It's a paragraph. You wrote this uh, about uh, 34 years ago, and uh, so let me get your reaction to it because it's critical to a discussion that's going on right now, today in the state legislature, having to do with the Delta and water quality. And and you wrote this. I believe it is essential that we de-escalate the verbal and legal wars between the state and the federal government and get on with negotiating reasonable standards for protecting the Delta and the two great water projects, meaning the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Only in that manner can we really protect and advance the public interest of the state. Uh, now that's something that you wrote at a time when the Delta wasn't in anywhere near as much trouble as it is today. Uh, are you are you troubled by the fact that uh, nothing ever really got done in the Delta? It's not going to get done until there's a crunch. <laughs> The people that have it don't want to give it up. The people that want it, I guess they're willing to pay for it, but the people that have it don't want to give it up, no matter what. Since this is an argument in the legislature right now, today, and since you wrote this 35 years ago, and not much has happened since then, huh? what's it, what do you think it's going to take? To resolve both the water quality and and water quantity issues in the Delta. If you were king of the water world, you know what what would you well, do? I would first of all work on the conservation, reuse and the wastewater by giving it treatment sufficient to be reused. And uh, that's a that's that's a that's in our hands. It, spends, it takes some money, and you have to determine where where when the money gets too much. But right now, there's a lot of water that we could afford to reclaim. Okay. Do you think some of that reclaimed water might? be used for agriculture instead oh, of... Oh, it could be used for everything except drinking. Okay, I'm, and I'm talking about widespread agriculture. I'm That's right. And I'm talking about every, everything except drinking. Uh, one of the... I'm not sure that you were ever involved in this, so, you know, if you weren't, you weren't. One of the problems with reclaiming water in the Imperial Valley, for example, is that uh, drainage water from the farms in Imperial goes to the Salton Sea. And it keeps the Salton Sea level up and, and keeps it reasonably, uh, well, I say reasonably fresh, it's not fresh at all, I mean it's salty water. Yeah. But the drainage water prevents it from becoming even more saline than it might. And, and so uh, my question to you would be, as a water guy, uh, my question would be, if you divert that drainage water from the farms in the Imperial Valley and reuse it, reclaim it, as you suggest, then you prevent that water from flowing to the Salton Sea. Right. And the Salton Sea gets worse. Right. That's, There's a conundrum. How, how do you deal with that conundrum? It's, it's, Salton Sea is a sink. It's going to get going to get worse. You can't have a salt and sea in the middle of the... I'm, 
an unsalted area. So your position would be just to let the Salton Sea do whatever it's going to do, and that's the way it goes. That's right. Okay. Uh, well, that's, that certainly speaks to your thought about the value of that water. That's right. Drink. And unfortunately, it flies in the face of... Uh, <coughs> Pardon me, the environmentalist community and federal law and state law and, and a bunch of other laws, but uh, your your thought is shared by, uh, of course, a, a lot of people. Because uh, hello, hello, uh, John. We're going to uh, change tracks here just a little bit. I'd like to ask you if you remember uh, working with anyone in particular while you were at Met. Uh, one of the people, of course, was Carl Baranke who eventually, be, he really followed in your footsteps uh, because he became general counsel and then he became general manager, yeah. just as you did. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about Carl? Do you remember working with him? I, I thought he was a very fine man. I, I have no, no, no qualms. Um, and how about... Uh, did you stay in contact with Evan Griffith, who was the general manager yeah. in between you and Carl? Evan, my recollection of Evan Griffith was he's too much of an engineer and not doesn't have an ability to span beyond the engineering. And the Rocky, on the other hand, he has a wide open field. Okay, well that's that's a probably a good characterization. Uh, you remember, how about Bob Will? Bob Will was also a general Bob counsel. Bob Will was the lawyer in Washington. He was knowledgeable. And I, I suspect doing the job he was doing is very effective. I don't know whether much, much about him. Okay. Uh, did you work uh, closely with um, uh, Hank Mills or Hank Mills or uh, a little, just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe I'm. I've forgotten when Frank Clinton was there. Did you know Frank Clinton? That Mike yeah, Clinton's dad, and he was also a general manager. Right. And w you were there at the time. I guess right. you were in the legal department. Uh, did you, you work well with with him, with right. Frank? But he was an engineer. Right. Why was he different from Ev Griffith? They were both engineers. Well, Frank, Frank, I felt was bigger than an engineer. He, he had blossomed out into all the supporting fields. And I don't, Griff, don't think Evan Griffith had. I don't know whether I'm. In other words, Griff had not expanded to the same extent that Frank had. Okay, so so Frank Frank Clinton was just able to take a much broader view right. of uh, what was going on. Uh, do you recall, one of the important components of Metropolitan Water District is its board of directors, which was quite large when you were there. It's, it's since been reduced. Uh, it's 36 or 37 members now, and I think it was 50 or 51 when you were there. Uh, do any of the members of the board, uh, did, did, did any members of the board leave a mark on you, leave an indelible mark on no. you? I can't even remember who they were. Yeah, uh, I, I don't recall who would have been chairman. Uh, Earl Blaze was... Remember Earl? Uh, from Burbank, Burbank right? Uh, was he chairman of the board while you were there? Was Earl chairman of the board while you were there? Or? He could have been. Okay. Uh, I think Lois Krieger was probably there. Right. You remember Lois? Yep. Any th she was one. Of the, she was the first woman on the board, as I recall. Right. Any thoughts about her? I mean, do you remember your relationship with with Lois? I mean, as the first woman on the board. Right. Her husband, Jim. Right. 
Okay. So, and so I mean, they were. It was probably a pretty good board while they you were, were there. Water people. Yeah. In okay. From the standpoint of the manager, it didn't bother me. So we got along fine. At least I think we did. Well, you you were successfully general manager, so <laughs> I'm sure there's something there that that uh, you got that says that you got along with them well. Um, has anything uh, surprised you with regard to development on the Colorado River uh, over time? Uh, I mean, the, I'll just throw some some concepts out at you, and you see what you think. Uh, Imperial Irrigation District agreed to be quantified because when you were general manager, they were entitled to an unquantified amount of water. Uh, you know, I, I'll remind you that Palo Verde Irrigation District gets the first priority from the river, and then Imperial got the next priority after Palo Verde used however much it could use. And uh, recently, historically recently, uh, Imperial agreed to uh, accept a hard number, a quantified number as their entitlement, rather than an open-ended number. Did that, did that surprise you? or no, I don't, I don't rem remember the issues that were involved there, that were, they were going on in Longville. But when you talk about the Colorado River, we were talking about a whole bunch of things that are going on at once. Uh, that's true. Did that give you fits while you were at, at Met, while you were GM? I mean, you got so many, so many balls in the air at one time. No, it's just you look at each one as how, how does that affect Met? How does that affect Met? Okay, so I mean, that, clearly that was your that's focus. Right. Uh, how about the growth of Las Vegas and their water demand? The growth in Las Vegas. Uh, did that has that surprised <coughs> you that their, their water demands have gone up? No. There's, a, there's a, obviously a reason that people are in Las Vegas. And when people go there, they, they need water. Okay. And you'd have, I presume, you'd have the same thoughts about Arizona uh, because Metropolitan used Arizona's unused entitlement for a lot of years. And Arizona is now taking its full entitlement. I've never stopped to think about those entitlements. Approaching. I never, I was never at a, at, at, under a feeling that, that Arizona's encroaching on Mets. So there's, for whatever reason, they may be a threat to us, but I didn't feel it was a great threat. Um, okay, and do you recall that uh, the Colorado is divided, uh, upper basin and lower basin? Yep. And each basin is entitled to seven and a half million acre feet of water. It's not quite that clean, but for our purposes, let's use those numbers. Uh, were you involved in any discussions with the upper basin while you were at MWD? I don't think so. There, there were going on, but I didn't get, get involved in them. Okay, so you're—I mean, you were focused on the lower basins, right. seven and a half million, and then MWD's share of that seven and a half right. million. That was your, your right. focus. Okay. Uh, well, let me uh, just ask you a final question here. What have we forgotten to talk about, or or what, what in your memory is important? Uh, there, there must be a few tidbits back there that uh, that come to your mind uh, over your career at MWB? Uh, what didn't I ask and, and what uh, the purpose uh, and let me just put, get this on tape. I mean the purpose of this tape is that future historians, attorneys, water people, whoever, uh, will have an opportunity to view this this video and uh, they'll have a chance to see what was in your brain and all of the other people that we've done the oral histories of uh, while you were there, while you were in the water biz. Uh, and so my final question to you, I guess, is uh, what stands out to you as being really important 
either over the course of your career or with regard to providing water for Southern California? Well, all I, all I can say is that in order for Southern California to get water in, in an increasing portion of the water, we've got to be treating our water that I'm, we're using as, as, as carefully as the others are. In other words, they are conserving the water and we're using it. We're all conserving water and using it. That's, so you, that's a simple. Right. So I guess you, you would say then that really conservation is the key to at least Southern California's future. Right. Okay. Anything else? Not that I can think of. Not that you can think of? Okay. Well, John, we will call an end to this interview then. Uh, it's been about an hour, believe it or not, a very fast hour yep. for me. And uh, we thank you for your time. And uh, uh, thanks again, and, and use water wisely. Well, you'll make me think about water more than I've been thinking.